<clears throat> okay, yeah, so welcome everybody. Today we are delighted to have Samia Saf from USC speaking about an insertion algorithm for multiplying super polynomials by super polynomials. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. The slides, I think the link to the slides will be posted in the chat. Um, so if you if you like spoilers, then you can go ahead and, and look ahead at all of that. Um, most of what I'm talking about today, oh, hang on, I'll put the chat up right in front of me. So maybe I'll see if you have questions in the chat. Um, most of what I'm talking about today is joint work with uh, my amazing collaborator, Nintel Bergeron. So here's the plan of my talk. We'll have a we'll have a break right here, which is actually the halfway point. Um, so the first thing I'll tell you about is um, what I did during COVID. I, I played around and found a, a rule uh, for multiplying a super polynomial times a Schubert polynomial. And then um, in the second part of my talk, I'll tell you about Schubert polynomials. Most of you here, just judging by the names, know more about Schubert polynomials than I do, but I'll tell you my way of thinking about them because it leads to the second half of the talk where I'll tell you the insertion algorithm that proves um, the conjecture up here. And this, this part here is all joint with Nantel. Um, so that's the plan. We'll get started. Um, the first part of this talk should be very easily accessible. So if there are any questions, then feel free to, to chime in. It should be pretty understandable. That's sort of the goal. So I'll start by telling you the problem. I'm not defining a Schubert polynomial yet. Somehow I don't need to. Um, there are these polynomials that are a basis for the polynomial ring. They're a basis, so I can multiply them and I can expand back in the basis and I can look at the structure constants that we get. So the, the fundamental problem that I'm trying to solve is I wanna have a combinatorial formula for these numbers, okay? So, okay, here's a combinatorial formula for these numbers. These numbers count flags in a triple intersection of Schubert varieties. That's a combinatorial formula. Um, I can't use that because literally, if you give me U, V, and W, I can't compute that number. So I don't count that as what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something simple. I'm looking for something I can explain to a child or a computer and have either of them do it correctly. So the rule that I'm looking for, which, I mean, I think this is open, but I've been told that it's been intrinsically solved and um, I don't really know what that means, but I don't think this exists. So I'm looking for a simple positive combinatorial rule for these numbers. And the gold standard here is the Littlewood-Richardson rule for sure polynomials. It's skew tableau that satisfy a simple condition. And it's something that you can just write down and check and you can work with. And that's sort of the, the standard that I'm aiming for. So this is the problem. So maybe, maybe we can debate whether it's open, but if you put this word in here, maybe we can. So I'm gonna be doing a special case today because everyone does special cases. So here's my special case. I'm looking at this guy and I'm gonna let the indexing permutation there be K Grossmannian. So what's a, what's a Grossmannian permutation? So it means that the permutation has a unique descent. So here's my example here. One, three, six, seven, those numbers are increasing. And then at position four, where the seven is, I go down after that to the number two. Seven is bigger than two. And then the numbers increase again forever after. Two, four, five, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, however you like, okay? This is four Grossmannian because there's this one descent right here. So K Grossmannian permutations are in bijection with K partitions. What's a K partition? So. I will be reversing a lot of the conventions that maybe you're familiar with in this talk. There are reasons that I do this, um, partly because it all makes more sense to me this way, but partly because it's actually easier to do all the constructions later if you allow me this reversal. So here is a K partition. This is a four partition. Why is it a four partition? Because it's got four numbers. They weakly increase, okay? And there's a simple bijection between these. So here, what's the bijection? Well. Here, what you do is you subtract one from the first thing, two from the second thing, three from the third thing, and four from that thing. And when you do that, you get zero, three minus two is one, six minus three is three, seven minus three is four, and that's this thing. Obviously, you go back in the reverse way, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and then you add all the numbers that you haven't used yet in increasing order thereafter. So these are in bijection. So instead of giving you a generic permutation for this one, I'm gonna give you a K Grossmannian permutation. But instead of doing that, I'm gonna tell you a K partition. I'm gonna say, hey, K is four, and here's my four partition that I'm doing, okay? So the simplest way to state the rule was actually stated without the details, so in this generality, 
um, by Bergeron and Satil in their 1998 paper, um, they said that they expected the answer to look like this, saturated chains in Bruja order from U to W, from here to here, with some condition depending on V. And now I know what that condition is. It's this thing that I'm gonna call lattice weight V and you have to use K Bruja order. So in order for this rule to qualify under my definition of what I'm looking for in terms of simple, I have to be able to explain it to you as if you were a child. Um, and that's what I'll do next. So I'll explain it to you in the simplest way that I can on the next slide. Um, but that's, that's what I'm aiming for. And this is, this is the problem that I'm solving. So we know what these numbers are when V has this special form. And here, there are no restrictions on what nu can be, and there are no restrictions on what K is, or U or V, or W, sorry. Okay, so Bruja order. So again, I think you guys all know this better than I do. Um, Bruja order, um, it's just, you take a permutation. A permutation is just the numbers one to 80 written in some order, okay? Uh, one, one to eight in this case. And you switch a smaller number followed by a big number. You switch their order, okay? Now you wanna do it in such a way that of all the numbers in between them, none of them has value in between. So if I'm switching the two and the five, the three and the four can't be in between them. Well, they're not, so that's a good switch. When I do it across K, I put a line here. So in this example, K equals four in this example. So when I do it here, I put a line at k equal four. And so I'm switching something from the left of the line to the right of the line. The smaller number is over here and the bigger number is over here. That's k Bruja order. So that's pretty simple. So I can do this switch and then I could do another switch. I could switch here the six and the seven and switch them to switch the six and the seven. And I can keep going and just keep switching things and take a chain. This is a chain. This is a chain in k Bruja order where k is four. Okay, so I've told you one of the things. Um, so Frank and Nantel decorated these chains with numbers. So they kept track of this chain, some information that's important is what's the big number? So that I'll call that a decoration on the chain. So every step on the chain, I write down the number that corresponds to the big number that I switched. So here two was the big number, is the one that was past K. These are the, the decorations. Now from this, I'm gonna derive more information, but it's all derived from the chain. So it's, it's sort of information carried by the chain. So that's, I'm gonna call these the Ds and I'm gonna tell you how to get an E. So you start with K. So K is four in this example. K will be four pretty much for the whole talk, I think, mostly. So K is four, so I start with a four. Okay, these are, these are my decorations up here. So you see five, seven, eight, two, four, seven, five. I just write down my decorations for my chain. And then from the decorations, I derive these Es. I so from five to seven, did I go up or down? I went up, so keep the four. Seven to eight, you go up, keep the four. Eight to two, you went down, so you need to decrement that four and it becomes a three. Okay, two to four, I went up, so I keep the three. Four to seven is up, I keep the three. Seven to five is down, so I decrement the three. That's it. That's how I get the E's. In general, nothing guaranteed that the E's couldn't go to zero or negative. That's fine. I'm not interested in the ones that do, not right now, but um, actually Frank and Nantel were, and they used it to define a really awesome quasi-symmetric function that we're also proving is sure positive um, with the same structures, but um, never mind that. What's the weight? Um, I kind of don't, don't really care about the weight, but just for fun. Um, it's the multiplicities you get down here among the E's. There are zero one, so the first position zero. There's one, two, there are three threes and three fours. So the weight for this particular thing is zero, one, three, three. Okay. So I have told you what K Bruja order is, what a chain is. I've told you what a weight is. So the last thing I need to do is tell you the lattice condition, but actually Littlewood and Richardson told us that. It's the same thing. So uh, you can go with this. Uh, the computer likes this one, um, but kids like the following one. So you take these numbers, Okay, and you're gonna keep the pairs. So you're not gonna split up the Ds and the Es. Okay, and you're gonna sort the top row. What does that mean? That means the two comes to the front, the four comes to the front. And then when you're moving the seven, the seven's gonna go right here. It's not gonna go in front of the other seven. You don't wanna over sort, right? Okay, and then you're gonna get this sequence. The Es are inherited. And now from the right, you look and you always wanna have, as you read the numbers, you always want to have seen at least as many fours as threes at least as many threes as twos, 
at least as many twos as one. And here we see a two, four, three, so the same number, four, we're ahead on the fours, four, three, three. So we always saw at least as many fours as threes. In particular, the number of fours is at least as great as the number of threes. Same thing for the threes and twos. Here's a three, here's a two, bunch of threes. And the twos and the ones, here's a two, there are no ones, so we win. So that guarantees that the weight will be a K partition, and that's the rule. Okay, so it, um, so I conjectured this um, back in 2021, but um, Natal and I have now proven it. So this is what these numbers are. So that's the rule. So if there's no other takeaway, and if you're really short on time, that's it. You're, you've got everything I have to say. Um, I'm going to tell you another way to think of this, which is, so this is the way that maybe is the easiest to explain it. This is the way that the computer, well, this one in particular is the way the computer likes to do it. But I'm going to tell you a graphical way that I like to think of it next. How do I think of this? Well, remember my gold standard is the Littlewood Richardson rule. That has to do with skew tableau. Technically, those are saturated chains, but we don't think of them that way and we don't draw them that way. We draw them with boxes, but really we should have drawn them with bubbles. There's a reason for the bubbles. So here, here's a bubble diagram. So this is a Roth diagram, an inversion diagram. What you do is, is like here in a, let's see, in, when you have a six, so I've written the permutation up this way. So um, U3 is six. So that means in row three, I put a dot in column six, okay? And then what I think of doing is I, I tile the whole plane with bubbles and then I pop all the bubbles in the row and column of every one of these bullets that I get. I just pop the row, pop all the bubbles and then whoever survives, um, that's my diagram. The survivors, the bubbles that didn't get popped. Okay. That's it. That's a familiar thing. Okay. So I'm going to do something with that. Um, I've written a definition on a slide. <clears throat> the, the key takeaways for this are I'm going to move bubbles down. I'm going to add a box and I'm going to move bubbles left. Okay. That's what I'm doing. In the classical case of Littlewood Richardson rule, all they did was add a box, but I, I have to get a little more excited. Um, I have to move things down and left. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to go with that example. The same chain that I had before, switching the two and the five. Okay, I start with the Roth diagram, which is literally this one up here. Okay, and I look at the dots that I'm switching. So the columns, the dots correspond to the columns that I'm switching. So here is the two dot in column two and the three dot in column, oh, sorry, five dot in column five. I look and say, is there a bubble in the top row, in the row of the top dot? Yes, okay, then I'm gonna move that bubble down to the row of the bottom dot, which I've done here, it's highlighted in red. And I always add a box at the bottom dot. And in the box, I put my E, okay? That we didn't use this one, it didn't apply, but it will in a second. Notice this is the Roth diagram for the shape I get by switching the five and the two. That's one way I can think of change. Here, remember the next thing I switched was the six and the seven. Let's see that. Six and the seven, it's this dot and this dot, column six and column seven. Now we, we don't have this case, but we do have this case. There's a bubble here, sort of, um, I think about the bubble, let's see, I'll draw it here, as in the rectangle between these dots and sort of the convex hull of those dots. There's a bubble down there in between. Okay, so the bubbles in the top row are gonna move down, but the bubbles here, we need to move them left. And what we, the rule for moving them left generically is ignore all the columns that have a bullet below and just move it to the next column to the left. So that, that will maybe come up, but I think this example might be too small to see the intricacy there, but it's not so important. The idea is that bubble moves left and we add our new box. And here we are, here's our new box. There's a difference between the bubbles and the boxes. Okay, that's why I'm using them differently. Okay, and let's keep going. So we can also switch um, the seven and the eight. And here, there's just, there's just no excitement. And in fact, this is what always happens in the Littlewood Richardson rule case, the classical case, is there's never any excitement. It's always the easy stuff. So we'll switch there and we added a box. And now what happens with our next one, with the one and the two? Notice two is smaller than eight. I've gone to the left with my column. So I'm gonna put a smaller number in my box, but all these guys are gonna move left, including this, um, this box. Right, the box is now a bubble sort of for all moves that come after. So I'm gonna move that left. I added the three, keep going. 
moved a lot of stuff left. Here's another move something down rule because this bubble's in the row of the top dot, so it moves down. The last uh, step was the four to the five. I shifted over. And this is what I'm going to call a uh, lattice permutation tableau. This carries with it all the information I need of the chain. Why? Well, to any Ross diagram, you can associate a canonical reduced word, which is pretty easy. I guess I can do it for this guy. This is in row six. So I'm going to do this six, seven. This is in row five. This is in row three, four, five, two. So if I read these numbers like a book, that's a reduced word for you. If I do it over here, that'll give me a reduced word for W, the shape that I have. If I read only the, the numbers that are in the bubble, I get a reduced word for U. That's the subword property of Bruja order. So for example, there's another chain with the same U and the same W um, and the same uh, lattice weight. So this is the other lattice chain because this Littlewood Richardson coefficient is two. So this is the other one. And notice that the configuration of where the bubbles are is different because there are two different subwords of the canonical reduced word for this guy that give me a reduced word for you. So this is really about subwords. So it doesn't matter that the boxes don't line up just so. Okay, it still counts. So this is two. The Littlewood Richardson number here is two. So that's that's the rule. That's how I think about it. And I'm going to point out what I'm going to talk about next is I'm going to talk about down and left, which is how we prove the rule, but that's a little bit backward from how I came up with the rule. I came up with the rule because of Conant's rule that moves things down and my way of decomposing Schubert's into keys, which moves things left. So these are the two main ideas that why I think of the rule this way is because things move down and left. Okay, so that's, that's the rule. That's the conjecture theorem now. And that's the first part of my talk. So now I'll tell you about Schubert polynomials, so that maybe the, the problem I'm trying to solve is well defined. Okay, Conant's rule. I love this one. Um, I don't know why people don't. Conant's rule is pretty simple. You start with any diagram you like. This happens to be the Ross diagram of a permutation, but whatever. You start with anything you like, and you pick a row. Okay, so here I'm picking, I'm picking this row, and I take the last bubble. So I could have picked this one, I could have picked this one, or I could have picked this one. But you take the last bubble in any row you like, and you push down. That's Conant's rule. It's really simple. And you just keep doing. Kids love this one, especially if you have like flattened marbles on a checkerboard. Here, what do you do? If you're, you want to push this bubble down, you just jump over a bubble if you have to. You don't go below the x-axis, but you can jump bubbles. That's fine. And you just keep pushing it down. And I'll just keep pushing down. I push down any bubbles I like. As long as I'm pushing down the end of a row, I can push a bubble down. Here, I'll jump it down. That's enough. So the set, if I start with the diagram, the set of everything I can get by doing Conant moves is the set of Conant diagrams for D. So in this case, this is D and this is T. T is a Conant diagram for D. Okay. Conant proved many things. One is that this generates sure polynomials. He actually did it more generally. He did it for Dimager characters. But for sure polynomials, um, you need to associate a monomial to each diagram. That's pretty easy. Um, here it's x1 cubed because there are three bubbles in the first row. It's x3 because there's one bubble in the third row. And there's no x5 because there are no bubbles in the fifth row. So the number of bubbles per row gives you the monomial. Add up all the monomials you get by starting with a Young diagram, which is a diagram of a k Grothmannian permutation. And you get a sure polynomial. And actually, the reason I like this is because there's a super simple bijection with Tableau. Again, I promised you I would reverse everything. I'm using reverse Tableau. Again, there are reasons. And one of the main reasons is because this makes this bijection really simple. I will talk more about this bijection in the second half of my talk. Um, but for now, just know it exists. And it's super simple and straightforward. And that's why I like Conant's rule. So Conant's rule gives you Schubert polynomials. Now, it seems to be debate about this. So maybe we should be debating peer review and how we should do that, because there are four published papers that prove Conant's rule. OK, so uh, personally, I tried to read these two and I could not. I couldn't get through them. I didn't necessarily find anything wrong with them, except that I didn't understand it. But maybe that was something wrong with me. I don't know. So I wrote my own proof of Conant's rule. And then because I so love Conant's rule, I worked with uh, Sam Armand, Grant Bowling and Henry Earhart. Um, who are fantastic graduate students that I have. 
Um, and we actually proved Conus rule holds for any um, flag sure module of a southwest shape. So that was proven in conjecture. Dominic Searles and I had that Conor polynomials in general are characters of modules. And we found the modules and Conor's rule works in a really beautiful way with Magyar's recurrence. It sort of falls out very nicely. So if you don't like if you don't like uh, these two and you don't like the one I'm going to show you in a second, then you can you can go look in this paper, too. Um, and maybe this is actually my favorite proof, but I'll, I'm going to give you a different one because it's easy to give on one slide. So if you don't mind Conor's rule, then you can skip what I say next. Um, if, you, if you don't like Conor's rule, maybe you like pipe dreams. And if you don't know what a pipe dream is, you can also skip it. It's a pipe dream. So you write a permutation up the y-axis, like I've done here, one, five, two, eight, six, nine, three, four, seven. You tile the plane with crosses and elbows, one per box. So you tile the grid with either a cross or an elbow. It's a pipe dream if when you follow the pipe that starts in row five, it ends up going column five, okay? And the pipe that starts in row three, or sorry, starts with the three, goes to the three, okay? And we've written the identity here. And it's reduced if the pipes don't cross more than once, okay? That's what a reduced pipe dream is. So this is a really nice model for Schubert polynomials. I'm gonna give you the bijection between this and corner diagrams. Okay, so first, Get rid of the clutter. Okay, so we we don't we don't need those elbows. The the crosses carry all the information of the polynomial, and you know that anything that's not a Christ cross is a uh, an elbow. So you might as well just get rid of the elbows. Okay, and then I actually want to do this with reduced compatible sequences. So the pipe dreams are, are kind of wrong. So I'm just going to shift everything diagonally. So there's no shift here and here. I just you notice that I just shifted one. Uh, there are three here, and there were only two here. So I just shifted everything one column to the right and then two columns to the right, three columns to the right, and so on, okay? So I have a bunch of crosses. I'm gonna turn the crosses into bubbles, right? Crosses for pipe dreams, bubbles for corners rule. And I'm gonna do it in a way that moves things left, a process that I call rectification. I'll justify this name of rectification later, but it's, the first case is really simple, but here you look above, the bubble, the cross you want to turn into a bubble. And you look in the column to its right, you look also above. And you try to pair bubbles that are in those two columns. And the rule is that if you have a bubble down here, you pair it with something weakly above it. That's a good pairing. That's what we're looking for. But here, not, there's nothing to pair. There's nothing up here. So I don't do anything. I just turn that cross into a bubble and go to the next one. And then here, there's nothing above it, right? There's, there's nothing up here. So, okay, I just keep going. Here, oh, this is exciting. We have a bubble. So this is a bubble that's in the um, the column here, but it doesn't pair to anything. So if I'm in the second column and I don't pair to anything, then I move left. That's what rectification does. If I'm in the second column and I don't pair, I move left. This is literally a crystal on the transpose diagram. It's a crystal action on the transpose diagram. So everything that crystal, crystal moves has, all the properties they have, this also has. Okay, and then this one, there's there's nothing above. Here, there's nothing above, so we'll go to the next one. The next one's exciting. Um, oh, sorry, this one's boring. Um, the next one's exciting. This one, there's just one thing to move, so it moves. Now, this one's cool because these guys pair. They don't move, but this top bubble that's red, it doesn't have anything to pair with, so it's gonna have to move left. And then when I get here, these two bubbles, they pair, and it would pair even if the this upper one was a little higher. It would still pair. You pair up and left, and so that, that red bubble moves left, and then here, this bubble to move left, nothing happens. There are three bubbles that move left. There are three bubbles that move left. And if you were paying a whole lot of attention, or if you want to cheat and look back at the slides, this is the corner diagram that we got before, or the Roth diagram for this permutation. That's the bijection. So when I say it's simple, I'm not lying. The proof has some lemmas. It's eight pages. I welcome you to look at that. Um, but from here on out, I assume corner Conert's rule holds for Schubert polynomial. Um, so we'll, we're good with that. And of course, the weight, I guess the weight here, the, the weight for pipe dreams is, is the rows of the crosses. And you can see that I haven't changed the row of anything. I was only playing with the column. So that works. And you can see this move left thing is important. So back to, back to the point. The gold standard for the proof of the Littlewood Richardson rule. What is that? It's RSK in my mind. I mean, there are many, many nice proofs. Um, but I mean, RSK is particularly elegant 
Um, you take a tableau and another tableau. You insert this one into that one. You get an insertion tableau and a recording tableau. And the recording tableau gives you your multiplicities. It's just beautiful. And all the properties it has is just awesome. So that's what Nantel and I did. We took Conert's rule for Schubert polynomial. And we look at the Conert diagram. And we take tableau because, you know, whatever. Tableau of K Grassmannian shape nu. Here's my K. We insert this tableau into this diagram. We get an insertion diagram, which is a Conert diagram for W. And we record it by the lattice permutation tableau by a saturated chain. And taking generating functions, that's how we prove the rule. So this is a good point to stop, pause for questions. And this is a good point to take that promised five minute break. Um, so if anyone has any questions, but I will explain in the next half of the talk, I'll get into the nitty gritty of this, why I put numbers in the cells. The colors are just there because I don't like looking at the number three. I'd rather look at the color green. So if you like colors better than numbers, that's what the colors are for. They really don't mean anything, but the numbers mean something. I'll stop there to see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, thanks very much for a very nice uh, first half. And, and yeah, time for questions. If there are any quick ones, 